introduction. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Hideo Joho. I'm an associate professor at the University of Tsukuba, Japan. And as Kathy mentioned, I am one of the uh, PC co-chairs of JIRA 2021. Um, this is my great pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker of the conference, Professor Judy Kay. Professor Kay is currently a Payne Scott professor at the University of Sydney and leads the multidisciplinary teams of human-centered technology research cluster at the university. Dr. Kay was named as one of the ACM distinguished members in 2018 for her outstanding scientific contributions to computing. Professor Kay's contribution to the academic community is also extensive, including the editor-in-chief of International Journal of Artificial Intelligence in Education and advisory board member of ACM Transactions on Interactive Intelligence Systems, among others. Dr. Kay received a PhD degree in computer science from the University of Sydney in 1999, and since then has a long-term interest in user modeling and lifelong personal data research. As we all agree that user modeling is an essential component in the research and development in information retrieval and of great interest among this chair community due to our focus on human information interaction. Today, Professor Kay will give us um, new perspectives on user modeling based on her research in creating advanced technology for education, as well as ubiquitous computing to allow people to have a better control on their personal data, which is also quite relevant to the advancement of personalization technologies. Now, uh, without any further ado, I'd like to welcome Professor Kay for her keynote presentation. Professor Kay, the screen is yours. Thank you for the very kind introduction and thank you to this community for welcoming me. I'm just delighted to be here. So I'm just going to um, bring my slides up and make myself smaller. And my title, which of course you had before, is rather tedious and long. And um, I struggled hard to decide just what to present. And I, I do hope that it speaks to you. I studied carefully the program for this year and the papers from previous years and was really excited to um, see the work. I guess that's giving away that I didn't know it before. Um, and maybe that's because I'm currently not working in information retrieval. I will say that the Australian research communities in this broad area are um, have had a long history, which I have linked with, and we've had conferences. So I know many of the people and have really enjoyed learning about their work over many years. Uh, and I'm particularly delighted to see uh, well, this is now only a few years old, this conference, but the welcoming of the human perspectives to information retrieval. I love good algorithms and I highly respect them, but um, the human side of things is where we actually get down to what might really matter. So let me go on. So I want to share with you my vision and um, broadly, I would love to share the, the job that I think many of you are trying to do, which is to what I call, call um, scrutability driven design of user models and their uses for things like information retrieval. And what do I mean by that? Well, it's four main points here. Firstly, enabling people to really understand technical systems that make use of their data. And obviously information retrieval is in, well, maybe it's not always in, based on human data, but a lot of it is. Certainly when you're going to do this to take account of the complexity of whole systems and so much of the current literature around this broad space, there's a lot of noise and a lot of activity in the area of explainable AI and so on. And most of it is just about this little tiny bit of the algorithms rather than the whole system. And I think we really risk doing stuff that maybe doesn't matter as much as it could if we fail to see the whole system. So the next bit, and I'll move it out of the way a bit, um, take account of the serious challenges for people if they're going to tackle this and to understand such systems. And finally, embrace both the, I'll make myself just a bit smaller, um, embrace both the system's complexity and the uncertainty right from the raw data 
through the reasoning and through the use of that data, very, very complex and lots of uncertainty. If the raw data is uncertain, things only get worse as you go through. And this four bullet points summarizes some of the challenges I want to share. Now, I don't know how much they mean when they're just listed like that. So I want to now spend my talk on that. But first, I think it's important to talk about the vision and its roots and, and where I came from. So firstly, my research communities. And the first one is AI Ed. I really started out wanting to build systems that will help people learn. And what I decided early on was my contribution was to say, hey, you're sitting at a computer. It could collect data about you while you're trying to learn at that computer. And if we get it right, we can empower you to learn better. But I deeply, deeply felt that the user model that's central to personalization was something that I really wanted to be sure that was done in a way that respected the rights of the learner. And especially when it comes to learning, learners taking responsibility is really important. And I've actually broadened that vision over my life to see lifelong, life-wide learning as including all the stuff that you are doing. When people use your interfaces, they have to learn to use them. They typically use them in order to learn something. And so there's a huge amount of learning. So uh, that's where my being editor-in-chief of the AI Ed Journal is um, relevant. And I would love to see a special issue on this area of information retrieval and the learning issues and how we build technology to do that. Our journal is rather um, specialised in that it's now into 30 years it's been out and it had a vision of AI as basically making technology work for us. It wasn't the narrow view of AI we have today. Um, but it also is a very technical journal. Many, many journals are about use of technology in education, but we're the people trying to build it. As I grew, I certainly found HCI as a home, but also Ubicomp, and that's where um, I guess I will again make myself much smaller. And I'm one of the editors of the ACM journal, which is called IMWAT, terrific for doing searches because it um, doesn't match anything much. And um, it's part of this shift towards a journal model, which I passionately believe in and therefore invest huge energy in. And similarly, I'm involved with the transactions on interactive intelligence systems, which again would be very um, aligned with this community. Um, but my second home um, that I began with was user modeling and personalization. And I'm going to show how its journal fits in the middle because what I love about it is it brings people together easily. People, it could be from information retrieval, recommenders, teaching systems, and we all learn from each other about the fundamental challenges of modeling people from data and then using that model for some useful purpose. I cannot uh, leave my interests without including computer science education, but I won't be touching on that today. But one very important thing that I think will show is that I have had lots of collaborations with lots of groups and that makes it really exciting to do research that will contribute to those people and that will show in some of my work. Okay, so a little more background in terms of some examples of systems that I've been building and I hope that that will help you understand where I am coming from at um, in the vision that I paint, because the vision I'm going to make is very much at a high level. And what I want to show you now is some concrete examples so you can see things I've done. None of them is really that close to what you're doing, but I'm trying to pick things that I thought would have valuable messages. And what I've got is these concrete examples, and then I'm going to have abstract stuff later, which I hope you can link up with it. So here are some of my favorite user models. 
Uh, one whole area has been in what's called surface computing. And the vision there is you have interactive walls and tables, and it was pretty fashionable a while ago to have interactive tables. Interactive walls maybe have got a better chance, especially if they're touch-based. Um, and this is one system that was deployed in a center for helping monitor emergencies and uh, bringing people together. And there are lots of wall displays and tables. Frankly, um, the people who've done most of the work, I should uh, make myself small so you can see Chris Ackhad as well. Um, most of the work is frankly, I think in bling, in boardrooms where they wanna have this stuff as well. Um, I think that this is still a maturing technology. But what I wanna now show you is um, some of the work we did in this context. So this is a tabletop and it is um, three young women in this case. And I'm not gonna go into the details. We've got lots of papers about it, but they're doing a task together. And in the foreground, um, just above the um, text is a microcone which is grabbing their speech and it can split it so we can distinguish the different speakers. And we also, um, a normal tabletop, most tabletops can't determine who's doing the touching. So we've got some fancy stuff um, with a, a depth camera and it's doing some fancy stuff so that it can work out who touches where. And from this, we build a learner model. And then we do a lot of work with the data and come up with displays about how well a group is collaborating. And on the left, we've got one, this is all anonymized and based on, uh, this is all faked just to demonstrate. Um, we did actually do all the work with real people doing real tasks. Um, so we build a, a dashboard showing this group number one wasn't very collaborative, group two was very collaborative and group three was sort of in the middle. But in spite of it being very fancy machine learning and very, very cool, um, and I'm ignoring the displays at the right, it was inscrutable. So in the center of this picture is Roberto Martinez, the PhD student who really worked on it. And um, at the far right, it, well, some of the other researchers are in the room as well. But this was when we did something no one else has done because they're not so lunatic as we were in our team. We ran a classroom for a whole semester and all the classes for two courses were in this classroom. And when we moved into a classroom initially for a business lecturer, um, whereas this is a computer science course, that inscrutable, incomprehensible measure of collaboration didn't cut it. So we ended up building something much simpler and you can see on the left, there are things to control the tabletop classroom, but on the right, is a very simple visualization of a user model. The details don't matter, but what I think is interesting is we had very complex sensor data and huge complexity in the whole thing, but we used that to build models. And the inscrutable ones that we could build in lab studies were very cool and the academic world likes them. But when we went into the real world, we went to something much simpler more in line with what most of the HCI world has done. And this seems to be, I've got a number of cases where we've done stuff where we've sort of found the same lesson. And frankly, if you had to explain and scrutinize even this simple one, it would not be that easy either. I wanna take another example, which is really highlighting the issue of raw data. And the raw data is different from what you deal with in this community, but the reason I chose it is it is data that you would have thought was incredibly simple. And when we read the literature, we discovered that the way it was used was frankly deeply flawed. And so um, obviously if really simple data like this is poorly used, we really have to worry about what's likely to be happening uh, when you've got much more complex data. So let me um, highlight what it is. Here are some papers, they were at IMWAT. And the purple authors in very small print are public health researchers. And that was really important for us to be able to understand our data and know what matters. So here's someone with their Fitbit and that was what we were talking about, 2009 it came out and we were really interested in what you can learn. Of course, 
things have moved on. People have smart watches. Everyone's got them. And what we discovered was that we really wanted to build essentially user models. Um, again, I'm not going to go into the details of what they were because the precise details are not terribly interesting for this community. But we knew we had incomplete data because, you know, it's hardly insightful to say that if someone is not wearing their tracker, there is no data. But how do you deal with that? And that is an issue that is not so far from the sorts of things you do have to deal with in this community. But what we wanted to do in this case was build an interface essentially to let people look at their user model for these so-called metacognitive activities that we all do in order to learn effectively, reflect on what's happening, monitor our progress regularly and plan how to change our lives. So it's a bit like this. We wanted to build a mirror. Okay, this one's not quite perfect, um, but you want to be able to see yourself and uh, be able to learn from it. And of course, building personalized advice from that user model would be useful. In fact, a lot of my work has really focused on just the bit that you see in the picture, which is how we build a model that enables a person to see themselves. And as they say, all models are wrong, some are useful. This one might be described as a lie, uh, but maybe it is useful. Um, the third example is getting a bit closer to this notion of scrutability. And this is where we had indoor localization, still a, a challenge. We still have problems building systems that can work out where people are inside a building. And that's very much a Ubicomp interest, but um, this is now making it a little bit closer to uh, this community. So what um, William New mainly built, but the other two um, PhD students, David Carmichael and Marcus Saad built a lot of infrastructure stuff that was relevant too. So suppose you want a display that shows you the people who are of interest to you. And this one's anonymized, but it's got dots showing all the people that the system quote thinks you're interested in. And um, then there's a list at the lower left, user A is at his desk and so on. And you can at any point click on a person's name to get an explanation. I'm going to show you a fully expanded one when you've done a lot of clicking on the whys. And the system explains or lets you scrutinize why it said the location was this desk 3 W32. And it says there's a system sensor with an ID and it was detected at that date. Is that very meaningful? I don't know. You've come in cold, um, it goes on because we've expanded it out. It's referred to as his desk. Um, and it would uh, say that desk 3 W32 is user L's desk and so on. The point is, um, I'll let you pause and look at it without a lot of context. It's hard to work out. But the reality is, this is pretty tedious to work out anyway. And yet, at some, some level, the things it explains are not that complex to think about, especially compared to some of the systems the information retrieval world uses. So generating explanations that people understand is not trivial. And uh, our users did well with this, but um, it's pointing to some of the challenges. I want to now give another example for some work that um, is now a focus of our research with PhD student Wahi Byaku. And um, it's very much this truth decay challenge and helping people see the difference between fact and fake. And this is a little closer to your community or a lot closer, except it's not that mature yet. So I want to first define truth decay, which is something we're working on with our colleagues in the Charles Perkins Center, where they're very concerned about fake news having a really detrimental effect on people's health. So there is the challenge of increased disagreement about facts. And I guess what are now called alternative facts. Um, blurring of the line between opinion and fact. All sorts of factors like this volume that is briefly mentioned, but also uh, a declining trust in formerly respected sources of facts. So 
We are particularly interested in the purple bits here. And I want to show you an example. So you've got some science news. And over here, it says face masks, critical in preventing the spread of COVID-19. And it's actually showing a surgical mask. And of course, there are some really interesting questions we're looking at. This is a surgical mask, not an N95. Does it really cut it for this? Mm, interesting question. And here's another one. New study casts more doubt on the effective masks, effectiveness of masks. So they're conflicting. People get conflicting news. And there are all sorts of ways in which uh, this comes from an initial source of some sort of research somewhere and filters its way, in this case, through to what might be a Facebook news feed or similar. And how do we tackle the challenge that people face in trying to understand, firstly, whether they should trust something, whether it's fake, and also whether they're good at doing that. Um, so this links up with my interest in learning. So back to the vision. Scrutability driven design of user models and their uses. And this is where I'm going to get to um, the issue of words. And we have a, a real challenge, I think. And there's this whole growth, especially in the AI world, just a total explosion in POPA's um, that are what called fate, fair, accountable, transparent, explainable systems, but it's the main conference which was called FAT. Fate has been called FACT. Um, and I also want to talk a little about some things that have been important in my research. Firstly, being very human centered. Secondly, really focusing on the asymmetry between human and machine interaction, we naturally tend to anthropomorphize. I try to avoid it, but sometimes it just is the easiest way to explain things, it's efficient. But fundamentally, I don't believe that a system should be allowed to be inscrutable, but we know people absolutely are. And I will come to that some more. And then I think the whole issue of hunting. And I think hunting is in the sense where I wonder how this system works uh, when there's an information retrieval system. How can I get more insights? Well, I start doing experiments with the system, doing different things to see what it'll do. Meanwhile, it's building a user model of me based on what I'm doing. And that's um, being broken because I'm experimenting to try and under understand the system. And I don't know how much that contributes to systems not working well, probably not a lot for systems people use every day, but um, in certainly teaching systems, it probably is. Um, ah, thank you, someone just reminding me my head's gone. Excellent. So why scrutable? And I guess I will move myself up here. Um, and make myself a little smaller again, a bit bigger. So why scrutable? And I want to speak about this very carefully because I don't want to be misunderstood. And um, I did my thesis finished in 99, as you heard in the introduction. And there was a paper in 1994 where I talked about cooperative user modeling. I was grappling with how to describe the sort of user model I wanted to build and the sort of personalization that would live on top of it. And I looked around for words and I decided after some very careful thought that scrutable was the best I could find. And let me just highlight why I rejected the word transparent and I guess I will make this a bit smaller. Um, so here is what one might call a black box. It's not actually black, but you know, you get the point. It's something that does something or other. It's got dials and they've been around a long time. And here we make it transparent. It's a transparent box you can see in, but well, you know, if someone says they've fulfilled their responsibility by making it transparent, well, they have in the sense that I can, with no effort at all, I can um, slide in, I can, whoops, let's just make it just a bit bigger. I can easily see through it, but I can't understand what's in it. So it doesn't really help me. 
Uh, here's an explanation and does it help? Well, maybe not. Um, I have to work out where to put myself. And this is part of the reason I rejected the word transparent. But I want to show you um, a Google Ngrams display of the frequency of words. Now, transparent, of course, we use in normal English. Everyone understands it, so it's, it's kind of a good choice. And um, I'm just going to get rid of myself completely there. You'll see inscrutable is a word we don't use a lot in English, but scrutable is looking as though it's sitting right on the x-axis. So I was reluctant to use a word that we don't use much in English. It sometimes turns up in the hard words section of dictionaries. And um, so how, does, how do we choose um, a word? I chose scrutable and I chose it because of the meaning it does have in English. And the reason I'm laboring this is because other people have written papers and uh, <clears throat> they've used different meanings for the word scrutable, which I find mysterious. And having prepared this talk and thought hard about it, I'm actually going to write to all of them and ask them um, why they've done that. So we'll see what happens there. So um, I'll go to the dictionary definition. There's a bunch of papers here that have developed the idea. And if anyone would like the slides later, I'm very happy to um, share them. But just briefly, the First and paper is the one I showed you already in 1994, where I was thinking about how to build this system that has really influenced my thinking. 2002, we built a server for keeping the user models um, because that's what we thought was important. 2007, we started building lots of Ubicomp stuff with sensors and did some really interesting work on how the architecture of the system could work and this 2012 paper summarizes a bunch of early work. There's very cool work happening today about how people can keep their long-term data. And that's going to really influence things. I'll come back to that later. But now to the dictionary definition and uh, I can afford to be here. So one good way to define words is to say, what are some other words? And you can see uh, some of these have turned up in this literature, comprehensible, not a very popular English word, um, fathomable, intelligible, that intelligible has certainly turned up, um, understandable, and so on. So there are some other words, but I really want to make myself much smaller and bring up a more dictionary definition that is why I chose the word for my work. Scrutable means that a person can understand it if they scrutinize it, where scrutinize means examine very carefully. Now, I'm using an IR system to do some task. Am I going to spend my whole life scrutinizing? Of course not. But the reason I chose this word is if I'm going to understand a system as complex as the ones most of us use every day with lots of personalization and user modeling, I'm going to have to expect to work hard. And to me, scrutinize captures that. So um, here's an example of something that's um, not scrutable. So it's inscrutable, the word we use in English. And um, here they are. Uh, this was Google some time ago. We think this mail is important because of our magic source. Now, it's quite interesting, they've changed. They actually provide a more useful explanation. But it isn't so long ago that it was acceptable to have this. And in fact, we can kind of thank Facebook for this. There was this election in 2016, and there was quite a lot of unpleasantness and news about that. And I think that has marked a shift in the public concern about these issues. So um, this community is certainly one that's tackling those concerns for IR. But I want to return to the word, the normal English we talk about people as being inscrutable because they often are, uh, because we know we don't really understand each other. In fact, um, understanding me is hard for me uh, because that's the nature of people. And uh, on the other hand, machines are different. We build them and I know I've written a lot of code that I don't understand. Um, but I like to think that I try to understand it. 
we build systems. They should be deterministic. I know that's an aspiration. Um, and we also know that um, we should put a priority on design for scrutability. Now, why am I laboring this point? Because at the moment, I see people putting a lot of effort into trying to make uh, algorithms in AI that people can understand, but not nearly enough into the whole system and the fact that we need to start at the very bottom of the design. And finally, we have to see scrutability potentially as a trade-off. So am I going to say that um, here's a system that is simple enough for me to explain and I've done user studies and people can understand it. And of course, understanding a system is a good starting point for changing it and controlling it. Um, or do I say, well, sorry, but the speed trade-off is too high. I'm going to build a system that people have built lots of experiments and shown no one could understand them. To me, this is a trade-off that I'd like to hear people talk about a lot more. And that's why I showed you that one about the interactive tabletops with this very cool algorithm that we academics thought was very hard to build and it was, and very impressive, great PhD work. But when you want to actually do something, is the cost of that worth it? So what is scrutability? I have another way of defining it. And I like this um, idea of a competency question. It was in Ontologies 101, a paper on designing ontologies, and I find it really useful. So the idea is when I'm doing my design, my design will only be successful. It's only competent if the system enables me to answer some questions. So what does the system model about me? At the moment, I have no idea what most of the systems I use do. Uh, what data does the system have about me? That's starting to improve um, in the sense that legal requirements, especially GDPR, are meaning that um, many systems do enable you to get at data. No one designed it for the purpose of you understanding it. That's my one concern, but at least it's a start. Where does all the data come from? And is it, for example, what's AI world is sometimes called ground or raw data, the stuff that was from clicks I did, or is it inferred, in which case no doubt there is room for new error. And how's the data used? And the one that is hardly ever discussed is how is the data interpreted? Because the same data can be interpreted differently. When we were building early teaching systems, we could decide for example, we know about bloom levels. If we require mastery means a high bloom level of competence, then uh, we look at it and we say, well, this data I've got here says a student doesn't know. But if we only require a lower level of knowledge, the same student, the same data, we might say, yes, the student does know. So the interpretation is really important. And finally, for privacy, where does my data go? And this is the reference that we recently wrote. Um, Bob Comerfeld and I have been partners in building the whole systems. Bob's more at the network and systems layer. Uh, I'm more at the HCI and teaching systems layer, layers. Um, for the British Journal of Educational Technology, it was their 50th anniversary and they asked us to write this paper or write a paper. Um, I'm not sure that educators are going to love it a lot, but I did actually, we did actually aspire to give some ideas to them as well, because they're the consumers that might demand things. And I want to emphasize that I see scrutability as a starting point for control. It's only a starting point, and um, I'm not even daring to talk a lot about control because that, you know, that's a layer above. And um, so um, scrutability is fundamentally a human challenge. And I don't see that in much of the AI literature. It's starting to change and people are telling me, yes, it is changing. Um, the volume of, of work, um, well, this community is, is doing work that's really needed in focusing on studies with whether users can actually do things and then to control complex systems. So now why scrutable again? 
And firstly, I enjoyed thinking through how best to argue this in this world where there are a lot of words, people use them to mean different things. But one of the issues we need to understand, if you're going to build interfaces, you need to know if the task the user is doing is low effort or high effort. And then whether you take a user-centered view or a machine-centered view. And here is the ideal on the bottom left that um, you actually have a system that is low effort for the user, but deeply user-centered. And I would say that that's impossible for a complex system. So you have a choice. If you want the ideal, then the system's going to have to be really simple. And the ideal is worth leaving there because we shouldn't neglect it if in fact, we can do something that's very sim simple and meets all the needs that people have. Um, but now let's look at some of the others. Um, explainable, well, yeah, that's to me very machine centered, you know, <laughs> I've explained it. And we as I think most of us here have done teaching and we're all guilty of this, I've explained it. So how come the students don't know it, you know? Um, transparent is a problem because it implies low effort. And to me, that's dangerous and it's not user centered. Uh, inspectable is also probably okay, but it doesn't really capture anything about people understanding it. Intelligible, interpretable and understandable, I actually meant them to be pretty close together. Um, they're very much user centered. If you claim a system is any one of those, you've got to do some studies. The HCI world maybe chose intelligible, which is why I put that there. But for me, scrutable is really important because it highlights the huge effort a user is going to have to make to understand complex systems. And we already know there's quite a body of work talking about having trusted bodies doing this scrutiny, just as we are getting bodies that do scrutiny of security and you have to pay for security audits. Similarly, for um, understanding how things work, we may end out doing that or having to say that um, if we can't, we need to do something simpler. So more challenges in terminology and uh, user models has already come up. And I just think it's worth noting the four meanings of user models. So in HCI, uh, a user model is something in a person's head. It's the model of the user in the mind of the designer. So it's something that um, we can't look at it's inscrutable, maybe um, inscrutable in the sense that um, I can't see into a designer's head. A whole lot of HCI is all about how designers do uh, need finding and have all sorts of techniques to improve their own model of the user. And uh, but the HCI world has long called that a user model. The word is also used for the implicit inferences and assumptions about a user that are captured inside software. And, um, you know, even from the point of choosing a font size to present things is making assumptions about what this user uh, wants to, how big a user wants to see things. Um, and a lot of that is frozen in software, not even a comment in the code to explain it. And some of it is because we when we're designing and building things, we don't even realize we've done it. Now that's really important and not to be neglected and in some ways um, is a fundamental part of HCI, but that's not what we're focusing on here. In AI and personalization, um, it is partly um, and it can be an individual user model. And again, my background in teaching systems is one where this was really important because I want to model this learner to personalize their teaching. And a personal user model is something that hasn't had much currency and one that I think that if you think about personalized teaching systems, you'll understand the notion very easily. Um, it has the potential if I keep enough personal data on my own machine that there could be two layers of the sort of personalization we see today um, and another level of personalization that relies on richer personal user models that is done locally on the user's machine without them having to release information that they don't want going out. For this community, this last definition is the most common. 
it's an explicit model inside um, some sort of machine and uh, you could externalize it perhaps and it usually represents many users many users clicks have been transformed into a whole lot of assumptions so um, having spent quite a lot of time focusing on this notion of scrutability in user models because i think they're going to be important language is important for making progress so if you're going to try and build scrutable user models you can distinguish that from what most of the um, ai researchers are doing but we have to recognize they're parts of a whole system and um, I'm now going to map that out and you have to think about where the user model fits in the whole system so um, this will highlight why it's so hard to scrutinize a user model and its use. And I've used two relatively recent papers to try and make sure that I'm on top of things. Again, I think the slides. So um, here are the um, technical elements that I see as important. You might argue for some more, but these ones are very useful. So firstly, the raw data. Um, I briefly, I gave you an example of that, Fitbit, you know, what could be simpler? Usually uh, it provides a count of steps in every one minute. Uh, very simple, and yet to interpret it well is challenging. And in our work with the public health researchers, the challenge actually began became that if we threw away users who had poor data because they didn't wear the device often, we ended up throwing out data for people the public health researchers wanted to know about. And so this is an issue that's relevant for everyone. Once you uh, deal with raw data in a certain way, especially when you clean it, uh, you start doing all sorts of things that mean that your user model you're aiming to build is definitely going to be impacted. So once you've done your cleaning, ranging, mun munging uh, phase, you then have the machine learning that has been so much a focus of a lot of the work lately. And I really want to focus also on a long term user model. So there are many systems keeping data about me for the really long term and the really interesting issues when you get to those. And then there are interpretations, not just one, and the personalization process. And finally, if it's going to be scrutable, we need some sort of interfaces that enable us to understand all of this. This is horrendous. Um, and it is important to just appreciate it and think about it. So the long-term user model is something that is stored somewhere and we could actually enable people to scrutinize. We did work in teaching systems where we kept a long-term user model and we tried to encourage learners to look at the model and uh, to understand what was modeled about them. And uh, we found that actually, even when they were struggling to learn things they needed to for a deadline, after they did each quiz, they would look at their learner model and they were interested in it. So then the question is, had we built our interface so they could understand it? But the whole issue of long-term user models is very interesting because we've got to remember they change. And if I'm wondering how the system worked a month ago with the data it had then, by looking at it today, enabling me to understand that is quite tricky. Um, so we need to allow some sort of time travel. Um, I want to emphasize again, there are multiple interpretations of the same data. And we actually kept data about people learning to use a text editor. And we had several different students doing projects that um, delivered personalized tuition or built other interfaces. And they use different uh, ways to interpret the data. Uh, for example, if you ask a learner whether they know something, how much weight do you put on that compared with um, the evidence you've got available from their actual observed actions. Very challenging. And uh, especially when you're building systems, you know people can scrutinize, you think really hard about these issues. And then firstly, you know, the bits that even sit on top of that, the per personalization and asking how that works is another layer. I wanna now go on to more of why it's hard um, we need interfaces onto raw data and sensors. Um, 
interfaces into the transformed data. So none of this is trivial. Um, the actual user model, and now we get to the ontology. Did someone actually create a description that explains what things mean and um, the methods used? Then there's all this infrastructure stuff and, you know, perhaps forgetting building in mechanisms for managing long-term data, um, multiple interpretations I've mentioned. And finally, I'm delighted actually the student, uh, best student paper award explores uh, scaffolding. I, I loved reading that. And um, especially since the result was a bit surprised, well, wasn't perhaps what you would have hoped, um, but scaffolding is an important area. The metacognition literature um, highlights that this could be valuable and also just the whole issue of history and how things change in the long term. So there are lots of things to scrutinize and I don't think we're doing nearly enough thinking about all of them. So yes, the interface challenges are huge and a starting point is just to think about it while you're designing things. So here's my research agenda. Firstly, raw data, which it's been highlighted is an oxymoron because humans designed it. Um, when we've got sensors, and when I talk about sensors, I also mean something that detects clicks. I did a lot of work on online dating, and we had huge amounts of data, some of it volunteered by people, but some of it also um, click data and so on. Um, very interesting to decide what you choose to keep. Personal user models, I've touched on that, but I want to emphasize that um, this paper that I, um, I mentioned earlier, written for an education audience, but trying to highlight personal user models. The reason the education world has a greater need for this is because people ought to be able to manage their learning by using and consulting this data. Um, Client-side personalization, I briefly mentioned, if you want very rich models of information about people, the nice thing about client-side personalization or a hybrid of some client-side and some centralized personalization is that you can split your data and not necessarily release all of it. Uncertainty, deeply uncertain, all of those processes in my map have got lots of opportunities for um, inaccuracy, incompleteness, noise, uh, someone using my device, so suddenly the data is not me anyway, lots of possibilities for uncertainty right through. And actually, I think one of the uh, HCI challenges, and I know the visualization community is embracing it as a, a core focus now, is how we communicate that effectively to users long-term data, I want to return to that, really big challenge for scrutability because, as I just mentioned, um, even if I look at my data now and think how it was used by a personalized system and what the user model is now, being able to understand what it was in the past is also really important for really understanding how my data was used. And this is all the more important because we can't spend our lives doing this expensive scrutiny. We're going to do it once in a while when there's a payoff. And I don't think we've even thought hard enough about what things we need it for. So um, I would love to see and hope to track some more scrutable, personal, long-term user models for information retrieval. And I'd love to see mine. I'd love to know what Google really thinks about me. Um, and others. And I guess one of the other big themes that's coming out is the humility we have to have in doing this. Um, we know, for example, there are lots of aspects of a user we cannot directly observe. We have no access to them at all. Uh, in teaching systems, we all have experience of that. We know that's a challenge. Um, there are the things we just don't know about, um, but we have to make do, but acknowledge the weakness. Uh, people change their minds in a teaching system. You hope they're learning all the time. And um, then there's the fact that context is deeply important. Um, so what's an accurate model of me at one time or place is wrong at another time. 
and um, there's also the challenge that people have limited self-awareness. Um, so obviously the AR community does have the opportunity to ask people things both as part of the IR interface and as part of the user studies, but there are lots of reasons why people's questions, um, people's answers might be very uh, challenging to interpret accurately. So we know that there's lots of incompleteness and inaccuracies. And I think it's really critical that scrutable models help people understand the uncertainty. So um, I would claim that we need scaffolding and personalization in helping people actually do scrutiny, but we haven't got there. Very quickly, a bunch of people have been important for helping me form my ideas and understand them and do the things you've seen. Um, and now I want to hand over to you and uh, please, I welcome your questions. Thank you, Judy, um, for a fantastic talk, which is, uh, you know, many aspects are quite relevant to our community. Um, so I'd like to take uh, comments, questions. Anyone? You can start talking. Yeah, Hideo, I'll, I'll jump in. Sure, go ahead. Judy, thank you for a, a really interesting and thought-provoking talk. Um, th this talk did exactly what I hope keynotes to always do. They make me think in new directions, even about topics that I've already been thinking about a little bit. Um, so thank you for that. Um, there were two things that I, I wanted to touch on. Um, one was one that I put in the chat. Um, as you were talking about the scrutability competency questions, um, I, I, before you got to that slide, I kept wondering, okay, well, how are you gonna define this and how are you gonna tell us what, what can be scrutable? And I like these questions because um, my impression of what you're trying to say there is that you know, if we know um, what data is being collected and we have some idea about um, how that data might be interpreted, maybe in some sense, that's what we do with people all the time, right? I don't know exactly what you're thinking about me right now, but I have some ideas about what you're thinking about me now, right? And so in, in that sense, um, we can look at scrutability through that lens Am I, am I understanding your message there or, or am I off base? <laughs> no, I, I think, um, well, I would agree with you. And I would, um, I think uh, the, the competency questions operationalize it, right? And they turn it into something you can test in an HCI study. I guess that's really pragmatic. And um, yeah, I mean, I'm just being, Just go back to more normal. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, I think that, uh, yeah, we, we really want to identify, well, I, I'm struggling with the fact that you mentioned how we scrutinize other people. I think we've got, that's a really complex process. And we've got lots of stuff we've learned and lots of rules of society um, about what we're allowed to do. In fact, one of the bum steers we got in our early work was um, that the Grice maxims that if a person says something, you treat it as though you believe it because that's good manners. Uh, so you point at, um, you know, the wall and you say that's blue and I actually think it isn't blue, but okay, uh, from now on I'm going to treat it as blue. And we actually built some scrutiny interfaces for students to look at an interface and if they had said that they thought they knew something, we actually made the interface say they knew it. And we actually had users say in the study, hey, one minute, all the evidence says here, I don't know it just because I said I did. How come you're showing that I know it? Um, so I think we have to be very careful about uh, making assumptions about how we deal with people. Um, and I actually think that we don't actually have um, rules about how a computer is meant to operate and but I think we do assume that it's going to be pretty literal and it's not going to be watching our feelings or following Grice's recommendations of politeness. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's really helpful. Um, I also will throw out there, I really like this idea about using um, these concepts uh, to help encourage metacognition. 
Um, there, there's a large group of us, I say large group, but a subgroup of us that are really interested in the metacognitive processes that people go through when they're doing search. And um, this idea of scrutability, I think, is, is important and uh, something that we can learn from with that. Um, so yeah, thank you. More of a comment than a question. Thank you. And I was actually really delighted to see this overlap between um, things that are important in the AI ed community and basically the learning community. In fact, metacognition is its own little religious discipline. Um, but yeah, very, very important stuff that uh, clearly should be better recognized in more interfaces. I was delighted to see so many papers that did actually take that in. Okay, um, any more questions, comments? Just speak up. Emma? Yeah, thank you so much for this great talk. I'm interested if you think there are domain-based differences and how much effort is necessary or like is reasonable to expect for scrutability. So like credit scoring is something like US law takes very seriously, right? Um, versus medical decisions versus online dating. If you, how do you think about reasoning about how hard it can still be while still being reasonable? That's a great question. And I really think um, we don't even ask it. <laughs> we don't even, I, I don't even hear us saying things like, um, you know, here is this domain, online dating is, is a good example that I know quite a lot about. Um, and, you know, how important is it? I mean, when we spoke to our industry partners, we said, would you like us to be able to explain to people? And they said, no, um, it was a while back. So maybe they would have changed. I don't know if you do well in a commercial service by saying we can explain to you how our system works, uh, especially since one of the things our system certainly did was to take account of whether the other person would like you. So there were people we did not recommend because we thought they wouldn't like you, even though we thought you'd like them. But we thought the cost of rejection was a problem. Um, but there is then the whole issue of, you know, if we've got to build these systems trying to be a bit of a nanny, I think that if we're going to build them, we should be open. Clearly, some of the things you've described, you know, things like a beautiful example are uh, letting people into universities it's so noisy we know we know every indicator we have is really noisy so um, given that's the case there doesn't seem to be a good case for saying well we get three percent better prediction power in this inscrutable algorithm so we'll go with that because we know 3% isn't meaningful in fact that's one of the the big issues what is a meaningful accuracy um, you know, in IR systems, we built a thing for automatically classifying your email. And when we did some experiments where we turned it on and it gave you a default, you just had to go click to say, yeah, I accept those recommendations. The performance jumped 10% because basically there were a number of classifications of email that we didn't really, we wouldn't have been consistent anyway. So I think that part of the Yes, the domain, absolutely. I agree with you, the domain is important. And a good starting point would be to at least um, say on any domain, what is a reasonable accuracy? In fact, IR is in general, a bit like all the machine learning papers um, we see in IMWAT, that it's, it shocks me that I see tables of accuracy for a concept that when you think about it, two significant figures is a lot. And they show five in all their tables. Um, it, you know, but I think scrutability is also going to demand, yeah, thinking about the domain, thinking about the accuracy that is meaningful, and then thinking about um, whether something very simple is simple that you demonstrate people can understand, because just because you think it's simple doesn't mean that they can. Um, and scrutable means that you've tested whether people can scrutinize it. I didn't actually say understandable. Um, that would be nice too. But if we can't scrutinize first, we can't understand. I hope that answered the question. Thank you. Okay, Dan, please. Yeah, uh, hi, Judy. Uh, I'm wondering, I mean, gonna, I'm gonna spring a little bit off of your comment about machine learning. 
and I wondered to what extent the systems that we're building with these very complex data-driven, very high dimensional spaces, very complex algorithms actually have an explanation in, of any form, right? I mean, it's one thing to say, we returned you this recommendation before that one because the cosine coefficient of this n-dimensional space, right? I mean, to what extent is scrutability a property that is human understandable? And how do we how do we deal with with systems like that that are very very difficult to explain or even for us to understand, let alone debug? How do we how do we deal? Yeah, I I agree. That's a really interesting question. But I think the first question is whether that complexity is justified for what you're doing. And really, I think in the case of a lot of systems, the measure uh, the relevant measure is whether your advertisers are happy with your performance, right? Um, that's the thing that's driving whether your recommendation method is acceptable, though I guess there are lots of recommendations. But yeah, there are lots of algorithms that I think are going to be very hard to explain. And um, I know that there are lots of people working. Neural nets are the ones that are famous at the moment, getting a lot of press for being very hard to understand. But, you know, I see people talking about rule-based systems as better, but if there are, I don't know, 400 rules, I don't know that that's going to be very scrutable either because no one's going to look at them all or understand them. Um, so I think uh, you're right. There are things that are hard to explain. And so the choice I make is whether I'm going to accept it anyway kind of reminds me of the privacy agreements that we all read in excruciating detail before we click. Um, you know, you do a cost benefit analysis in your head and you say, I agree because the 10 seconds that it would take me to think more um, isn't worth it. So yeah, we have a lot of systems that are very complex. I would love to know if they really actually do that much better, but I don't know that anyone's going to share that. Does that answer your question? Um, it, it, it's a good start at it. I, I do think it's an intrinsically difficult problem, but, but thank you for the attempt. Thank you. Uh, Matt, please. Um, oh, yes, thank you. Um, a, a quick question. Apologize, um, zooming in on, on a very micro passing um, uh, comment uh, you made, Judy, which was uh, your mention of a, a system to classify email. Um, and uh, because I'm a personal information management student, also in Sydney, by the way, um, I was just curious as to what that comment was referring to and if that's a piece of published work. Uh, yeah, it's published work with Eric McCreeth a long time ago. Um, if you send me some mail, I'll send you some pointers to it. But uh, it you. was sort of in, in at the time we were both really surprised. But uh, when we thought about it for a few minutes, we were less surprised because we'd been doing the usual thing of doing classification. Um, I think there are some other examples I've seen where obviously you can start getting it, an idea of what accuracy is makes sense for a domain. Thank you. Any more questions, comments? Um, Paul, do you want? Yeah, sure. So, following yeah. up on, on, on Dan's question, um, when can I lie? Um, and in particular, when can I lie, tell a white lie by simplifying a really complex system? I mean, maybe we can't explain, Dan can't explain Google because Google's really complex. But is there a point somewhere along the line where you can say, this is a simplified version? It's it's not actually true what we're saying, but it'll help you understand. Is, is there a point where that's that sort of inaccuracy is, is justified, do you think? That's a really good question, because I can think uh, the interface I showed you of the Google Mail that said it was our magic source, they now have something much more meaningful than that. Um, and I think that reflects, I'd love to know the history of why that changed, but uh, it's still not telling the full story. And uh, in fact, going back to Dan's comment, you know, there is some level at which we could give some sort of explanation of many of these systems that might be better than nothing. Um, 
and maybe we try and understand better why people would ask the question and see whether we can answer that you know is it because I'm wondering what are the implications of my doing something or other or not um, but your suggestion of a lie is that you explicitly tell the user something well, white, you know, it's not white. true um, to say well this is very complex and um, this is an explanation I can give you is that helpful I don't think we should ever build systems that lie explicitly I mean, I think maybe maybe it's like when you give your first lecture in the beginning of first programming course, which was one of my favorite areas to teach. And I'd say to students, look, I'm going to tell you this is not quite true, but at the moment it's a useful generalization yeah. that I, I think will be useful to you. At what point uh, but I actually you, um, said that, and I think that we should build systems so they do that. Yeah, so people's system oversimplify. So is, is there a point where it's okay to say, um, you know, electrons orbit in atoms nucleus, right? We know that's not true, but it's, it's, a, it's a useful model, right? I, I don't know how comfortable I feel, you know, exposing things that aren't, aren't actually entirely true, right? Uh, but maybe it's, maybe it's okay. Okay, the very famous quote, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Yeah. I think um, that's fair enough. I think there are lots of times, well, at the moment, we're not doing very much at all of explaining very much of anything. Uh, and what I'm more concerned about is we don't even think about it when we're designing our systems. I'm not even sure that someone in a large organization says, well, gee, part of the price of going this approach is that we'll never be able to explain it. We know, or we, we're very unlikely, to, never's a long time. Um, we think it'll be really hard to explain, but we're willing to do it anyway. Um, and in fact, going back to the earlier question, you know, in a teaching system, I think the, the situation is different. I think if you're actually building a system where a learner is meant to be learning from a computer, um, lying should be treated as more unacceptable. Uh, we actually found that when we were designing our learner models in this approach, we actually thought about the names of the variables differently. <laughs> Not that users saw the names of the variables, but you know, suddenly it made us just think differently. But I, I agree with, well, actually there's been a, a trend, Dan and you, yeah, there are some things that are really complex. So maybe we need to bite off something that we can do that is still useful. Um, but we need to start work, looking more at what people need to know. Okay, um, is there any more comments, questions? Um... People in the chat, do you want do you want to say something about it? Alistair, Peter Bailey, Jaime, Anita. You guys are fine. Cool. Any other comments, questions? Okay, I don't see any hands raising, I think. Right. Okay. So uh, let's thank our speaker again um, for a very interesting talk. Thank you very much. Great to be here and good luck with the rest of the conference. I'm really pleased to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Thank you. Um, maybe we, sh uh, are we stopping recording every time? Okay. Uh, before you guys go, um, or uh, 